Hey, praise the Lord. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Once again, I'm Reverend Michael Jakes. You know, salvation is the greatest gift that God has given us. But when you are not sure, the devil can bring torment into your life. Are you saved? And are you sure? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I pray you be blessed as we go into the service right now. Be very sure. Amen. We thank God for you. We thank God for his word. I want to bring you to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6. Philippians 1, 6. And I also want you to turn to 2 Timothy 1, 12. Two scriptures. Philippians 1, 6. And 2 Timothy 1.12. Let's all stand as we read these two scriptures. Let's all stand. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now 2 Timothy 1.12 For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You may be seated. Lord, we bless you. We thank you. We pray that now as we read your word, Lord, that you might have your way, Lord Jesus. Someone here needs to hear this word today. Lord, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. These two statements, two different books, written by the same person, Written by the same person. Written by the Apostle Paul. Both of these statements express a certain assurance of who they are and who God is. And if you're going to have a successful walk with the Lord, if you are going to walk with Jesus in strength and power, you are going to need to know who you are in Christ and who your God is. If you don't have an assurance of who you are and who he is, your enemy the devil will come along and try to tell you who you are and try to tell you who he is. In other words, it's very important that you take a stand on who you are in Christ. Christ, that if you're saved, that you know that you're saved. And nobody should be able to tell you otherwise if you know it. Both of them, both of these statements come from the core of his being. And no matter what happened to Paul, no matter what happened to him, number one, he was he was unfazed by the difficulties that happened to him in his life. His faith was undiminished. It did not go down just because something bad happened. He did not allow circumstances to dictate how he was going to serve God. This was his proclamation. And let me go over Philippians 1.6 real quick. It says, being confident. He had a confidence. He knew. Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know? If you're saved, do you know it? If you're saved, you should know it. You should walk in it. You should, you should boast in it. You should flourish in it. If you're saved. If you're saved, your feet are on the ground and you're walking with Christ. If you're saved. He said, be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun the good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who saved you. 
Jesus is the one who picked you up out of your sin. It's all about Jesus. He's the one who started it, and Jesus is going to be the one who is going to finish it. No one is going to be able to take you out of his hand. If you're saved, save. 2 Timothy says, for which cause I also suffer these things. He was going through some stuff. I guarantee you, as a Christian, and this is not to frighten those who are not Christians, but I guarantee you that as a Christian, you are going to go through some stuff. Stuff. That's the best way to put it. Stuff. Stuff is going to happen. And you're not going to have any rhyme or reason why it happened. You're all set to do this and that and everything is just the way it's supposed to be and something happens. He says here, for which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. I'm not going to be put aside. I see what happened. I know what I'm going through. I see what's happening. I don't get it. But I'm not going to be put back. I'm not going to be put into a corner. Nothing is going to stop me from keeping on doing what I have to do. Because, he says, I know. You see, his faith was based on the confidence that he had in his God. Not confidence in himself. Confidence in his God. He says, I know. In spite of whatever happens, in spite of whatever goes on, in spite of what people say, in spite of what goes on in my life, it says, I know in whom I have believed. I know in whom I have believed. So it doesn't matter what goes on around me, he says, because I am convinced, I am persuaded that he is able. If you don't know that God is able, you're going to find yourself in a hole. God is in and you need to shout it, you need to proclaim it, and you need to tell the devil, my God is able. God is able, and he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Just what was it that Paul committed unto him? His life, his soul, his existence. When he got saved, he said, Jesus here I am, take all of me. I am convinced that he is going to keep me no matter what happens, no matter what goes on. I'm convinced because I'm in his hands and my God is able. But there's a problem. There's a problem that we run into. That was the proclamation. He tells us who he is. You might know who you are. The devil's always going to come and try to knock you off your little pedestal. He's always going to come. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, you can turn there, you don't have to stand up, but Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, he's just finished in the previous chapter talking about, talking about, Faith. Talking about faith. And in verse, in chapter 12, he says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed or surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all the people who did things by faith, in chapter 11, he says, Let us lay aside every weight. Is the problem in your life? You are going to have weight. Weight. I'm not talking about physical weight. You are going to have weight. And the weight has to be taken off and laid aside because it is unnecessary. It is unneeded. You can live without it. What is the weight that he's talking about? 
When he's talking about weight, he's talking about any anything that is heavy, that is bulky, that you are carrying, anything in your life that is stopping you from serving God the way you're supposed to. Any extra baggage, let me say, that you are holding on to, that you are taking along with you in your Christian life. Here I am. I'm a Christian. I'm serving God. I'm serving God. Me and my God. And I decide and I'm living my Christian life. I'm living my Christian life. Do, do I need these things? Do I need these things? I, I, I don't need them. I can live I can live without these things. In your life there's some stuff that you can do without. I don't know what it is because I'm not in your life. But there's some stuff in your life that is considered extra. And you can do without it. In some cases, it's a thing. It's, a, it's an action that you do. In some cases, it's my, it might be a person. Whatever it is, or whoever it is, it's baggage. And you can live your Christian life much more comfortable without it or them. Lay aside the weight, the extra, the thing that's holding you down, the thing that's holding you back. He says, lay it aside, get rid of it, put it out. You don't need it. You don't need it. He says, lay aside, because this thing is going to stop you from being all that you need to be in Christ. This thing is going to stop you. You're not going to be able to flourish. You're not going to be able to be blessed the way you need to be blessed as long as you carry extra stuff around you. You won't be blessed. You won't be blessed. And finally, he says the weight. Now, let me say one thing about the weight. The weight may not be wrong in itself. This extra weight may not be sinful in itself. Okay? What's weight for you may not be weight for me. So what you're holding on to may not be a bad thing, but it's a bad thing for you for this season in your life. So you have to be very careful. It says, and the sin, the sin. You have to stop right on the sin. So it's two things that we have to lay aside. Two things. We got to lay aside the weight, whatever it is, whatever it is extra that's holding you down. I don't know how many of you here have ever run track or do run track. Okay, to look at me now, you wouldn't think I ever used to run track, but I used to run track. I used to run track. I used to run for speed and for distance. Yes, I did. I used to, yeah, yeah. I, I, I used to run. I used to run. Where my wife at? She gone already? Yeah, didn't I used to run? She gone. She gone. I used to run. <laughs> Is this a fact? Is this a fact? Was I good? She was there. She was there. She remembers. Selective memory. Selective memory. She remembers. So, so when you, before you run, the way they have sneakers today, they're lightweight. Back in my day, they were very heavy and thick. But now, you strip down to your sneakers, a little pair of shorts, a little tank top, and you run. And you go. Because you're running a race and you don't need extra stuff on you. You don't need extra stuff on you. We would go out and we would 
have races. I wasn't the fastest, but I was fast. The, the, the furthest distance I believe I've ever run, and it's the furthest I've ever run was from was from Coney Island to the Verrazano Bridge. That's 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 I'm, whatever how long that is. I don't know. It's not it's not that far. It wasn't that far to me. What was that? That's not that far. But but that's 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 that was my distance. When you run, you have to, you can't run with all of that extra stuff on you. You have to let it go. And this is what he means by carrying this extra weight. But the sin, sin, sin always, sin always has to be let go. Sin. Because sin does something. Sin does something to you. Sin, it says here, it besets us easily. That's the word that I have here in the King James Version. It easily besets us. That's a word that nobody uses anymore. What in the world are you talking about? It besets. What is beset? It, it besets us. <clears throat> to beset means to surround to surround if you've ever been and I have been if you've ever been and I hope you haven't been if you've ever been attacked and jumped by a group of people and beat down before they beat you down they come around you they surround you and you know uh oh it's a problem. And so when they're gathering around you, they are besetting you. They're stalking, they're coming around, they're there, they're there. It's a terrible feeling when you know that you're about to get beat down and there's nothing you can do about it. It's a terrible feeling when you're outnumbered and there's nothing you can do. Outnumbered. One person against Many. What do you do when it's just you against everybody? You can't fight everybody. You can't fight everybody. And so when I was getting beat down, I have to admit it, when I was getting beat down, when I, I didn't even see it coming, I walked into my beat down. I walked into it. I literally walked into it. I'm walking. I'm, head, I'm, I'm walking, headed downstairs to the locker room for gym class, my first period of the day, and I'm walking in, and I go through the staircase vestibule, and all of a sudden, I get greeted with a shoe, a boot, a foot in the face. Put it! Now, all I saw was light and stars when that happened. And so it's crowded. It's in between periods. People are moving. I hear people saying, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I just got kicked in the face. Could you help me out, please? I get kicked in the face, and the next thing I know, when the foot comes down and I'm gathering myself, I see the person who did the kicking. And so I started to come back because I got kicked in the face. Come on, what are you going to do to get someone kicking the... So I, when I went like this, they all just mobbed on me, and it was just... And so my mind says, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. So I just sort of bent over and tried to take it. What am I, I just crouched down and tried to cover my face, tried to cover, and they were, they were coming up with knees and coming up with uppercut, they were coming up with everything, but they wasn't catching me because I was like, I was like this. And so I'm down there, I'm down there covered, and my mind is blazing a mile a minute, I'm saying, you gotta get out of here, man, you gotta get out of here. They're gonna kill you, so I'm down here, and I just, 
I'm down here, crouched down, and I just said, ah! <laughs> I just jumped up and sort of went like this. And when I went like this, I caught somebody in the mouth because I left a teeth mark right here. Caught somebody like this here, and I just went crazy and just ran through the crowd. And so I'm running down the hallway on the first floor, in between periods when the hallways are crowded with people, and I'm running down the hallway. I'm running. Huh, huh. And nobody's even caring. This knucklehead is running through the hallway, breathing hard, and I'm running. And Somebody stopped me and said, what's going on? <laughs> Somebody said, what's going on? I said, I said they, beat me up. they beat me up people. <laughs> Nobody cared. Nobody cared. I was on my own. I was on my own, you know? So it, it, it is a terrible thing to be, to be jumped on when you are all alone. And from that moment on in high school, I was very careful about where I went. Every time I saw a crowd of people that didn't look right, I would have to go through my little ritual that I had. Now back in high school days, I was very, 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 very skinny. Skinny, thin, thin. I couldn't hurt anybody. I was so skinny, I couldn't hurt anybody. But every time that I saw a group of guys that looked like they might try to start trouble with me from a distance and I had to go that way and there they are, I would have to put on my... <laughs> so here I am walking regular. I'm doing my regular walk. But when I see the group down there getting ready like I think that they're going to do something to me, I started, I started walking like I, like I was going to do something. And one time, they were there, and they were looking at me. And I started my little, like that's going to help. And I started walking. And these guys were going to jump me again, a different group. I just was very jumpable in high school. They, they were going to jump me again, a different group. And I... When I got up on them, one of the guys who was in the group was in one of my classes. And he said, let him go, let him go. I know him, I know him. And so I was a Christian back then. And I didn't even, I, I, I remember, I didn't even say praise the Lord. I just said, thank God. Because I was going to get jumped again. So to be surrounded by a group of people when you know what they're getting ready to do is a terrible thing. And in this verse, that's what a besetting sin is. It's a sin that stands up around you and over you and it taunts you and it tells you that there's nothing you can do. A besetting sin is a sin, it is the sin that always gets you down. What sin what specific sin in your life are you susceptible to? What is it in your life that is wrong, that is sinful, and you know it, that you always find yourself doing and you always feel sorry after it happens? That is a besetting sin. A sin you prisoner. It besets us. A besetting sin can sort of tower over you like a mountain. I'm going to give you three besetting sins, but I want to dwell on just one of them. Fear is a besetting sin. Fear. Fear can stop you from doing things that you need to do. 
Fear is a monster because it won't allow you to function properly. Fear. Second is worry. It's a besetting sin. We worry about things that are never going to happen. We think about it, we're wondering about it. I wonder, I don't know what's going to happen. We worry about things that are never going to take place. Third is the one I want to dwell on for a little while. Is doubt. Doubt. It's being uncertain. It's not being sure. It's not being sure. And I'm speaking about your own Christianity, your own salvation. Doubt. I don't know if I am. I don't know if I'm saved. I'm not sure if I'm saved. I think I'm saved. I don't feel saved. That's that. Here is here's the what I call the 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 paradox. And let me define that word because it's a word that you may not know. A paradox. Paradox is just something that someone says that sounds kind of ridiculous and sounds kind of absurd, but more than likely it's true. No matter how crazy and ridiculous it sounds. Here's the paradox. You have people walking around who are absolutely 100% bona fide, guaranteed, saved, born again, filled with the Spirit, love God, walking around not sure if they are. For some reason or another, they're not sure. They doubt. They doubt whether they are saved or not. And here's the paradox. Then, the other side is you have individuals who are just as saved as this little thing I just picked up, and we know this thing is not saved. You have people that are just as saved as this thing right here, walking around, thinking and believing that they are saved. And they're not. And they glory in their salvation. They're happy about their salvation. But yet, they're not really saved. See, because these, these unreal Christians, they have a different standard for their life. They have a standard of their life that has been approved by themselves and by the people that they run with. It's okay you do that. It's okay you do that. It's okay if I do that. It's okay. It's okay. It's me. That's how I am. That's what I do. That's what I like. Uh, uh, uh. That's not Christianity. That's not Christianity. So the paradox is you got people that are saved that are not sure, and you got people that are not saved that I'm sure that I'm saved. Something is wrong there. Something is wrong there. Doubt, the Bible says that doubt will. Doubt. The Bible says that if you doubt, let me, let me go to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 23. Hebrews 10 and verse number 23. <clears throat> it says, let us hold fast or hold firm the profession or the confession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promise. We have to hold firm if I'm saved, if I'm truly saved, if I know I'm saved, I cannot allow the devil to tell me Otherwise, the Bible says here, nothing wavering without doubting, for he is faithful that promised. You may not be faithful, but God is faithful. When you are not, God is faithful. It says in James 
James 1 6 James chapter 1 verse 6 it says but let him ask in faith nothing wavering or without doubting it says for he that wavereth or doubts is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord a double minded man is unstable in all his ways when you allow doubt to enter into your life concerning your salvation you open up the door for instability instability am I am I not and it's like a wave on the sea you're like a wave on the sea uh, uh, first first Kings chapter 18 and verse 21 first Kings chapter 18 and verse 21 let me turn to that real quick first Kings chapter 18 and verse number 21. It says, 1 Kings 18, 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Elijah says, how long are you going to go back and forth? How long are you going to waver? To halt, that word halt, basically means to go from this side to this side. Halt. How long are you going to go from here to there? How long are you going to go from this side to that side, jump from one end to the other? How long are you going to be so indecisive? How are you going to do that? How long are you going to do that between two Different opinions. He says, if God is God, save him. If you believe that the devil is God, serve him. And the people still yet indecisive. Am I going to? Am I going to not? Am I? Am I not? They still did not come to a decision. They didn't say a word. By not responding, not responding says a lot. It says a lot. So we need to stop wavering. Doubt is like a storm. Doubt is like a storm. When you go to Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14, and in verse number 31, Matthew chapter 14. And verse number 31, Jesus is speaking. And Jesus is speaking to Peter. And he tells him in 1431, he says, and immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. Peter had just gotten out of a boat and started walking on water. Oh, yes, he did. Peter got out of the boat, saw Jesus walking on the water toward him. Peter said, Jesus, I want to come to you. And Jesus said, come on. Peter gets out of the boat, steps over the side. First man, other than Jesus, in history, the man started walking on water. I don't know how many steps, the man started walking on water. Hey, he's walking on water. Wouldn't that be great? And it wasn't ice, it wasn't ice. He was walking on water. And he's walking, and all of a sudden, 
The storm is raging around him. And all of a sudden, when the storm is raging, ra the wind is blowing, the waves are on, he's walking on water. All of a sudden, he realizes that he can't walk on water. And when he realized that he can't walk on water, even though he was walking on water, he began to doubt when he saw everything around him, and he went down. And Jesus, in verse 31, says, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, Oh, thou of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Is doubting sin? There's two sides to that. The Bible says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. However, Jesus did not tell this man that he didn't have any faith. He didn't say, where's your faith? Why did you doubt? He said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Doubt is an indication that your faith has been diminished by life's circumstances, storms, situations, circumstances, and your faith, you see what's going on around you, it's too much, Wow, I can't take it. I can't deal with it. This is uh, this is too much. I can't. No, no. And when you're looking around and watching everything, your faith takes a hit. And your faith goes down. And you doubt. Is God there? Is God really there? Am I really saved? Am I going to get help? Doubt happens when your faith is diminished. You have Paul in the book of Acts, chapter 27. I'll try to bring this to a close. Acts, chapter 27, and verse number 25. Acts 27, 25. You have Paul in a ship with many people. He had been told, he says, Wherefore, sirs, this is Paul speaking, in the middle of a storm. A storm is brewing on the ocean. And he says, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. What's the difference between what, what Peter did and what Paul said? Peter had it right. He got out for a little while. He was working it. He was doing it. He was doing what God had told him to do. And he was walking on that water. But the circumstance got too great. And he began to doubt. And he went down. Here, a similar situation. There is a storm. And Paul says, I believe God that it's going to be just as it was told me and it ended up being just as it was told him nobody was hurt the, 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 the ship did go aground but nobody was hurt when it comes to your salvation when it comes to your salvation if you are saved number one are you are you relying on your feelings if you are you cannot trust your feelings your feelings will betray you your feelings will hurt you. Your feelings can change. You cannot live this Christian life based on your feelings. I wake up in the morning sometime and I don't feel like praising God. I don't feel like doing what I have to do. I don't feel like it. We cannot go by our Feelings. Second, when it comes to your Christian life, are you basing your Christianity on your performance? In other words, are you basing it on what you do for God rather than what God has already done for you? You do something wrong. 
you feel lousy, and your head hangs. I messed up again. I'm no good. You begin to hear voices. You begin to hear the voice of the enemy. He begins to condemn. He begins to condemn. You mess up. You sin. Again! And you really start to hear it. I'm not saying. I, I, I can't be saying. This is too much. And it keeps happening. Look, the devil is a liar. You have to take the path of peace. What is the path of peace? The path of peace is to allow allow the thorn to do his business. What am I talking about? What is the thorn? Whatever it is in your life. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. It was something in his life that God put in his life. I don't know what it was. And it may not be doubt. I'm not talking about doubt at this second, at this moment. But it was something that God put in Paul's life to keep his feet on the ground. God put that thing in his life to keep him where he was. God gave this man, Paul, abundant revelation. He told him stuff that he didn't tell the disciples. He told this man, Paul, things that he told no one else. Took Paul to heaven, the third heaven, and spoke to him and sent him back down to earth. This man, Paul, was given much. And in order to keep his mind and his pride from blowing up, because it's easy to get blown up when you are being used by God like that. Paul could have said, I'm better than the disciples. Jesus came down personally and talked to me. And to keep his feet on the ground, the Bible says that God put a messenger of Satan in his life. A messenger of Satan. What was the messenger of Satan? Some people say it was some sort of ailment, some sort of sickness, some sort of pain in his body to keep him praying for help. The Bible says it was a messenger of Satan. It could have been something like that. But a messenger of Satan, it could have been a literal demon that was hounding him. Hounding him wherever he went. This thing kept Paul. The Bible says that Paul prayed three times for relief. Jesus, please, I need your help. I don't need this. Three times he prayed and God said, no. God said, my grace is sufficient. All you need is my grace. So sometimes we go through some stuff that God has allowed to be in our life so he can show us his grace. His grace. That's the path of peace. That was the thorn in Paul's flesh. We got to let the thorn do its ministry. Let the thorn have its way. What's the plan? Number one, if I'm going to get doubt out of my life, if I'm going to get sin out of my life, I got to do what it says here in verse number one of chapter 12 of Hebrews. Number one, I got to lay aside. I got to lay it aside. Kick it out. Put it to the side. Take it off. I don't need it. Lay aside that weight and the sin. Number two, it says in verse number, uh, number one that I got to run with patience. Patience. When am I going to get delivered? When? When? We have to be Patient. Nothing is going to happen overnight. And God can deliver you overnight. God can deliver you in a moment of time. But run with patience. Listen, you are not, the Christian life is not a sprint. It's not a sprint. The Christian life is a marathon. It's a marathon. So you got to sell yourself in. You got to pace yourself. And do what you got to do. It is a marathon. You're going to be running for your life. For your whole life. You're going to be running. Running. Number three, you got to look to Jesus. That's probably most important. You got to look unto Jesus. When you're going through your problem, when you're going through your situation, when you're having it, when you can't take it anymore, when you are ready to throw in the towel, when you're ready to give up, who do you look to? 
take out your trusty phone and call up so and so. You better call up Jesus. You better get him on the line. He's only a prayer away. You better call on Jesus. When things look impossible, Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. Not the boy, not the girl, not your friend, not your buddy. Jesus is the only way that you are going to find peace when you need it. Finally, it says, consider Jesus. So you got to look to Jesus and you got to consider Jesus. Consider him. That means, think about him. Think about him. Think about what he has done for you. Think about him. Think about, as the song is, think about his love. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace that has brought you through. Think about him. Don't just look at him. Think about him. He's given you promises. And I'm going to close with this in 1 Peter 1.5. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 5. Here's the promise. It says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Kept. If you want to be kept by God, He will keep you. He will keep you. As long as you see Him, as long as you look to Him, as long as you consider Him, He will keep you. It says, let me, I got to go back to verse number three before I get to that verse five I just read. It goes back, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Don't you see, as a child of God, don't you see what you got to look forward to? We have something that is undefiled, that will not fade away, waiting for us in heaven. And then we are kept by his power. Devil, I know you want me to go. Devil, I know you want my life. Devil, I know you want to destroy me. But I'm kept by the power of God and I am going nowhere, no time soon. Devil, try as hard as you want. I'm here. I'm here to stay. I will stand when I don't understand. I'm not going anywhere. Devil, take a back seat. Because you, you're under my feet. You're under my feet. That's how you Abolish doubt. Doubt. Keep you, you don't know, keep you unsteady. But when you know who you are and you know who your God is, I'm standing. I'm standing. I went through the doubt thing. Early on in my Christian life, I went through the I went through the doubt thing for a little while, wondering, am I, am I not? When I was a teenager, that was a long time ago. I was, am I? Look what look look what I'm doing. Look how, I'm, am I? Am I? Am I? Am I? And, and God just just made my old salvation real to me. I, it comes out very brash and comes out very proud. I know I'm saved. I don't know how else to describe. I know that I'm saved. I'm not perfect. I don't always do the right thing, say the right thing, act the right way. I know I'm saved. And no matter what I may do, 
that may not be Christ-like or godly, I know that I'm saved. And nobody can tell me otherwise, especially the devil. No matter what, I'm saved. And when you get to that point in your life, when you know that the devil can't tell you who you are and dictate to you who you are, you know you have reached a new plateau in your Christian life. When you know I'm saved, no matter what I'm saved, I'm saved. I'm saved. Are you saved today? Do you know that you're saved? Are you assured? Do you know it beyond a shadow of a doubt? I'm saved. I'm born again. Christ is in my heart, in my life, and I know it, and no one can tell me otherwise. If you know that, you step to the next plateau. If you don't know that yet, you're on shaky ground. Shaky ground meaning that the devil is just going to play games with your mind and with your heart because you don't know. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. I don't think so. The devil is a liar. Bow your heads, please. Bow your heads. You're here today and you're not sure. First, let me talk to those who are not saved at all. Because those who are not saved are different from those who are not sure if they're saved than those who are saved. So if you're here today and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know you're not saved, you're not born again, the Spirit of God is not living in your life, in your heart. You're not saved. Then I will not walk out of this building without the assurance that I am saved. I will not walk out of this building without knowing that I'm saved. First invitation for those who are not saved. You're not saved. You're not born again. I want you to lift up your hand. While all heads are bowed, nobody's looking around. You're not saved. You're not born again. Jesus is not in your heart. You're not walking with him. I want you to lift up your hand. Doesn't matter if you come to church every Sunday. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. If you're not saved, Jesus is called. Is there anybody here that's not saved? Anybody else? Once you put your hand up, you can put it back down. Is there anybody else? I am not saved. I'm not. And I know. Maybe you're here today and you are not sure whether you are or not. Brother Michael, I'm not sure if I am. I... I prayed, uh, I got baptized, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know. Sometimes I think I am, sometimes I think I'm not. Uh, kind of confused about that part, I don't know. If you're here today, I want you to lift up your hand. Because you too can walk out of here sure, sure of who you are in Christ. Is there anybody else? After you put your hand up, you can put it back down. Is there anybody else? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I'm saved. My third invitation for those who are saved. Saved. Born again. Legitimately Walking with Christ Loving God And you know it And you know you're saved But you still Have a lingering Doubt Doubt 
Maybe you don't feel good enough sometimes. Jesus is here. Jesus is here. If you did lift up your hand, I want you to stand stand where you are. I'm not gonna ask you to come up to the front. But if you lifted up your hand, I want you to stand right in your place where you are. something called assurance, Lord Jesus, that we know beyond the shadow of a doubt who we are in him, in you, and who our God is. Lord, I pray that whatever it is that is causing doubt, whatever it is that is causing uncertainty in this life, Lord Jesus, Lord, I pray that it might be moved aside, Lord Jesus. Lord, the devil is a liar. He wants to confuse. Lord, he wants to, he wants to bring condemnation. We know that, Lord, you came to destroy the works of the devil. And we know that if we are a child of God, that the devil has no part in our lives, Lord Jesus. That we, with you in us, Lord Jesus, rather, when you are in us, Lord, we are the, we are the match for the devil. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So, Lord Jesus, I pray for your mighty anointing to come on these who are standing here right now, Lord Jesus. That you might fill them with that calm assurance, Lord, that they belong to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, for those who are sitting in the congregation, Lord, who don't know you, Lord, I can only pray for them, Lord Jesus. They have to respond. They have to acknowledge their need. But, Lord, I pray that you will have your way with the hearts in the congregation that don't know you, Lord Jesus. For those who are yet still confused about who they are in Christ, Lord, I pray that you will speak to their hearts also, Lord Jesus. Lord, for those who are struggling, Lord Jesus, Lord, I pray that you will give them strength, Lord Jesus, and help them to allow the thorn to have its perfect work, Lord Jesus. Lord, have your way in every heart and every life, Lord Jesus. Move by your power. Move by your spirit, Lord Jesus. As you fill us with your grace and your anointing, Lord Jesus. Have your way, Lord Jesus. We bless you. We bless you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.